acidity in cheese. But that is why cheese goes so well with white wines, because of that acidity level. So, are we there? We're nearly there. <laughs> Are we there? Right, sorry folks, what a, what a disaster. Are we there? We're there! Hello! I think we're there, I think we're there. Right, I'm so, apologies, uh, it's, you know, it's all new stuff for us really, isn't it, this, this technology. Tinkering on so, the edge of technology. Like I say, just think of your parents with their Zoom calls, we're all struggling. Sorry, even Finn's sort of got bored waiting. But um, we were just talking about canapes, actually. Uh, so, we have our lovely Sauvignon Blanc, we and do. I know that some of you, if not a lot of you, have uh, have made the canapé. So we're just gonna have a little chat about those and get everyone to kind of uh, get involved and eat them, uh, whilst <laughs> we just wait for everyone to to arrive again because we have had a little issue with um, power. Well, here's the thing. So we're talking about Sancerre. So um, did you know that you also get red Sancerre? Mm. And here's the question. Does anybody know the grape variety that's used to produce red Sancerre? Out in the ether. Well, I'm going to tell people because YouTube are listening. Okay. And they don't have the opportunity to, to ask, okay. ask us a question. It's actually Pinot Noir. Mm. Now, sun, red Sancerre is delicious. It's beautifully light. Beautifully light. Um, wonderful for drinking in the summer months. Mm -hmm. You can chill it if you, if you want to because there's sufficient fruit in that Pinot Noir to make it just a lovely, lovely light you know, chilled red Easy wine. drinking red wine, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, just whilst we're talking, thank you everyone who's joining us back again. Sorry about that. Bit of a disaster uh, on the uh, on the power front. Dog's so. not bothered, are you, doggy? Here you go. Here, have one of those. There's a good chat. <laughs> so, where we're at, we've got our little canapes here. Uh, I've slightly deviated from the recipe because I found some really nice um, they're vegan beetroot crisps. Um, and I thought, actually, they'll be a really good little base for this. So we've got the vegan beetroot crisp with a layer of goat's cheese and then the soy infused goat's cheese on top. And I just popped a little coriander leaf on because it looks pretty and gives it some colour. So, would you like And one? I was just I'm saying, saying yes, you. I have one. Yes, thank you very much. And I was just saying the importance of marrying acidity in the wine, so mm -hmm. your blonde being naturally high in acidity, with acidity in the food. Yeah. And yeah. Um, many people aren't aware of this, that the, you actually do have quite high acidity levels in, in cheese, and particularly in goat's cheese. So the two of them come together, marry, and basically create this, as I said, match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. cheers, mm -hmm. cheers. Um, so the other main grape variety of the Loire region is... Dum -dum -dum -dum. Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc. Thank you. Everybody knows Chenin Blanc. We talked long and hard about Chenin Blanc from, um, on Sunday evening because it's such a main, well, it is sort of the main white grape variety in, mm -hmm. in uh, South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. But Chenin Blanc is, whoopsie, whoopsie. Sorry, there. sorry. Um, Chenin Blanc is used to make white, uh, dry whites and also pudding wines. Mm -hmm. So the pudding wines that come from the Loire Valley are known as uh, Bonzo or Cap de Chaume. And these are, when I say pudding wines, these are really seriously pudding wines. Yeah. They don't tend to come out in full-size bottles. They tend to be in half bottles. They are expensive and they are delicious, but you have to have the opportunity. Um, yeah. So thanks again for rejoining us, guys. Sorry about the, uh, the, the slight technical issues. That was... Um, yeah. You know, one of those that you just learn by doing and then you won't do again. <laughs> but, here, but, but actually, go aside on. from Sancerre, okay, what, what is the probably the most famous wine that comes from the Loire Valley? Okay, over to you guys. Do the you know? most famous wine from the Loire Valley. Everybody knows it. Big in the 80s, big in the 90s, big in the 21st century too. So big. And I love it. <laughs> so I big. It. Okay, what is it? And what is arguably, it? arguably, still very good value because it's a bit of a lost soul. It was. It did used to be very big. It is... Jump, dum, 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 dum. Oh. It is... Muscadet. Ooh, yeah. Muscadet. Um, <laughs> I've just got a mild concern that we might be... Um, What's well, on our sides, but we'll stick with it. Um, and just see how we get on. <laughs> so, thank you for rejoining us. Again, we were, said, we were talking about the beetroot and goat's cheese. 
the acidic element of the canapé and how well it goes with the wine. And it'd be really nice to know, have you guys got the canapés? I know I've seen a picture of, uh, ah. Right, sorry, this is, this is, an... there we go. Uh, okay, so moving Pam. Hi. <laughs> We've Technology is not helping this evening. We've had to go with the mobile phone option because we have had a power issue. Uh, so uh, hopefully it's we'll just figure it out. It's worked. Okay. Okay. Sorry about okay. that. And thank you for being patient. Anyway, it's good to see from a different angle because these days get repetitive anyway, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So the beach of canapé. Who's got it? Who likes the combination? And. Um, Oh, and actually, I'm always I'm interested to know this. Who doesn't like the combination? Mm. Mm. So Finn would like it, but he can have a normal biscuit. That's a good boy. Mm. So I think they marry really well, because we've actually got the baby beetroot that you get in the jar. This is tough times from a grocery shopping perspective. <laughs> so they're sliced, but slightly pickled, so they've got a vinegariness. Yes. Um, and then with the soils, uh, soy as well. Yeah. Um, I think that works really well. I do, and I tell you what, that tiny little carrot coriander leaf on the top actually makes the, a massive difference. Yeah. Um, and I'm yeah. really, really pleased to tell you, so the chap who, who, who produces this wine, his name Henri Bourgeois, he's a proper guru. He really sort of set the world on fire in the Sancerre region in the 1950s. Um, and since then, his, his sons have taken over. Mm -hmm. But he suggests this wine with... Chavignon goat's cheese. Ah, so there we go. There. I knew I was onto something. He also <laughs> suggests it with halibut in lemon sauce. Ooh la la. We could have put that out there, tricky. And for the South Africans, King Clip Carpaccio. King Clip. Yep. Ah, King Clip okay. Are the Wahlbergs still with us? He uh, also submits his wines into various different uh, um, competitions mm -hmm. and he won gold in 2016 in the uh, Concours de, what's it called, Concours Mondial, which is a massive thing in France. Oh, ah, there you yeah. go. So he knows what he's doing. And when we choose our wines, we have to go on a few things. Um, taste is the number one most important, but also very close to that is, yeah. uh, is it worth the price tag? Yeah. And actually as a, a non sancerre yeah. at £13 a bottle or, yeah. or wherever we're at, I think that's great value and mm. I love it. I also, another point, Henri Bourgeois, um, in more recent years, and we haven't got it at the moment, but he, I think he probably got a bit bored of the Loire, and um, <laughs> he buggered off to New Zealand and set up shop in New Zealand. So he now produces, um, he's got quite a big parcel of land in, in, in New Zealand, and he's now producing Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir in New go. Zealand. Now go. we used to stock this, so anybody's interested, give us a nudge and we will get it back in yeah. because it was yeah, good and I don't good. really know yeah. why we're not doing it anymore but um yeah it's very good and um wines from New Zealand are definitely on the up from a popularity perspective yeah yeah um so just gonna go back and for those of you who didn't hear the answer um and who have managed to rejoin us after the disaster that was the ba <laughs> battery gate um the other main white grape variety in the Loire, in fact, the main. So this is a Sauvignon Blanc, and which there is quite a lot of Sauvignon Blanc grown there. But what is the main white grape variety? I think we did answer it, didn't we? Well, I think we answered it whilst we were still sort of in uh, limbo land, or okay. <laughs> purgatory, or wherever we were for a wee while. <laughs> so well, for those of you who didn't hear, hazard a guess. For those of you who did, don't say anything. Uh, hi James Harris, you, I think you managed to join us after our technical hitch. So, uh, and the other thing is, yeah, just go going back to Muscadet. Oh yes, Muscadet, Muscadet being probably the most famous uh, wine that comes out of uh, the Loire Valley. Mm -hmm. um, that's made out of a little grape variety called Melon, as in melon, Melons. Melon de Bourgogne. Um, and uh, the nice thing about Muscadet is uh, we've got a couple of muscadets on our list, I believe. If mm -hmm. they're not, then again, nudge us and we'll put them on. There's at least one. Okay. <laughs> um, but the nice thing about muscadet is that they're pretty under understated and undervalued. So you can generally get really good value for money with a muscadet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, any, any, any fans of muscadet, we want to hear from you because if there are fans out there, then yeah, I, I for one, be quite happy to bowl into 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 France as soon as the opportunity arises and 
go fill up the van. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it is great. It is great. It's one of those wines that you relate to the experience of being there as well. That's the only thing. Yeah. Like it's uh, it's such a experiential thing. It's like seafood and shellfish on the yeah. on yeah. the west coast kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fab. Um, yes. as we've had a, an answer from Wahlberg Walk, the Wahlbergs, uh, Chenin Blanc. So Very good. Well done. Maybe that they right. heard us say it. Well, let's <laughs> give them the benefit of the doubt and just say well done. Cheers. Well done. <laughs> okay. Should we crack on with the next one? Okay. Well, cheers, Ben. You want to cheers, Ben. Before we carry on. Oh. There you go. Oh, it's a messy glass. This one. <laughs> good boy. Okay. Right then. Well, right then. um, interested what you know about what you think about the beetroot thing. I think it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, just you know, <laughs> I think it's Crack brilliant on. actually. Um, any of our tastings, and, and bear in mind that we do an awful lot of well, we generally do an awful lot of external tastings, and we all well, most 99% of the time, mm -hmm. we tend to use this this canopy components, um, the beetroot and the ghost cheese with Sauvignon with Blanc, Sauvignon and it, it, it goes really well with the Chilean Casas del Bosque Sauvignon Blanc as well. The Casas del Bosque Sauvignon Blanc is on the website. Um, it's got real punch to it mm. by comparison to the Henri Bourgeois, uh, Petit Bourgeois, which is a little bit more sort of refined. I mean, we're talking classics here, mm -hmm. um, but equally it goes great with this. So you go with whether you like your, well, but I, we love them both because yeah. one is sort of classy and refined and the other one is a big punch in the face of ripe Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. Uh, and there's a place for both. Sometimes Ooh. you need a punch in the face, mm. I believe. Um, Here's Samantha James. Yeah. I love beetroot and ghost cheese so much. It's great. Please tell us where you got the beetroot crisps yeah, from. Yeah, actually, do you know, I went. Really I, had to, I was delivering some wine to uh, 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 someone's house just near Battersea Power Station, right near Battersea Power Station. And there's a little shop there, which is a deli come expensive shop. And um, they have these uh, beetroot crisps. And I thought, well, they sound quite interesting. Uh, vegan, gluten-free, you know, all of the make you live longer, elixir of eternal life. Um, but actually make a really nice little canapé base so you've got a little a little thinky beetroot biscuit which is good so I will send you the the actual brand name once I've read the box <laughs> cheers I'm just going to have another one yeah okay so whilst Jude's doing that I'm going to grab the red and I'm just going to remind you that we're going to have a good old conversation about rosé on Sunday evening when we won't have any technological issues promise you that um, it's going to be fun grab yourself a glass of rosé on Sunday evening, if you haven't got one from us, there's still time. Um, and then also another shout out to say that actually we're still delivering all over the country. We're still getting our questions. We're, it's strange actually. People think Hannibal Brown. We're a, we're a local business, which is wonderful. Like Wimbledon, we are. Yeah. Wimbledon, Worcester Park, Surrey area, um, and uh, we'll go to pains to get you your wine, if not the same day, the next day, and what have you. But we do have a service which is set up to deliver all over the country. Um, we successfully sent a DIY tasting kit to Amsterdam yeah. this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, International Women And of also business. these DIY tasting kits, which again are on the website, they're great if you are absolutely sick to the back teeth of this lockdown and you want to have a bit of a sort of quiz competition between yourself and your families or your neighbours and this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. You basically all buy your DIY tasting kits and, uh, well, everything's there for you. Yeah, it's great fun. It's yeah. great fun. Um, right. But then you can always join us as well on, Tuesday, on Thursdays and Sundays. So yeah. you're just spoiled for choice. Right um, then. Right, onto the rouge. Now, Ooh. from a canapé perspective, you're probably thinking that doesn't look like lamb and carrot and cumin puree, and it's true, it's not. Because we did um, a Zoom tasting just a matter of less than a week ago, yeah. and we had the lamb with carrot and cumin puree as the canapé with the tempranillo, and um, we just <laughs> couldn't do it again. So we've actually gone shredded chicken, which is next week's canapé with the Pinot Noir. Okay. Uh, so that's what's sitting here in the cucumber, if you can see that. Yeah. Uh, and then on to the most important bit, the vino. Da, da, da. This little baby. There we go. So, Monsieur uh, Pablo Urbina from uh, the Rioja region. This is his 1999 Selection. So, 21 years old. Um, this needs a lot of TLC. Now, we could have decanted it, but in actual fact, what we did, we rather actually just got a massive great glass <laughs> yes. and essentially decanted it into the glass. Um, there, so it's been shut down. It's been in its bottle for near on 20 years. What's most, in, what's most noticeable 
because it's 20, 21 years old, what is noticeable is the colour. And anybody who's got this open will see the sort of the bronzy brown mm. sort of hues around it, which is essentially, you know, this wine is, is old. It's old. But it is nowhere near past its sell-by date. Mm -hmm. And that's the wonderful thing about these Riochas. So Mr. Urbina came into our office, ooh, how long ago? About 18 yeah, months ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago. And truth be said, it was a, it was a Friday morning, 10 o'clock. We probably had a few drinks the evening before. No. And, uh, <laughs> and he insisted on opening all of these wines at 10 a.m. on a Friday morning. And it was like, oh my God. And he opened his 1994 vintage, which is on the website. Yeah, really good. His 98, his 99, and his 2001, I think, at the time. Mm. And we were absolutely smitten instantly. He'd previously, the previous evening, he'd done a big dinner. And the food components that he put with each of these wines were very gamey. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there, was, there was duck, there was... Pigeon, yeah, big flavours yeah. of like, you know, earthy mushrooms, truffles, uh, foie gras, all of that sort of big, big stuff to basically like marry to get all balance with the, uh, the, the, what's the word? The, what's the word? Flavours. The flavours, I suppose. One, the flavours. Yeah. The character. Yeah. The, char yeah. the character of his mm -hmm. wines. Um, and, um, well, we didn't have the food that morning, but... I tell you what, we were two very happy people at Yeah, Tech absolutely. No, morning. that was fantastic. And and I think the beauty is that you can buy the wines old and you don't have to sit and wait for them. Um, I'm just going to pop back to comments here. Uh, yeah. Sam has done the veggie option of a, um, of the lamb canapé, which is really good, actually, with aubergine, because aubergine is such a great meat substitute. Mm. And with the carrot and cumin puree, I think the thing that works really nicely is the earthiness of the cumin with that bit of oak that's and it's in got the a wine. it's got a bit of vanilla in it uh, if you put your nose in there and give it a good old snuff you get a sort of earthiness and sort oh, of vanilla here, yeah. here you go there we go, there we go. vanilla um sort of almost like coffee coffee aromas and is it's everyone big. drinking the wine i'd be really interested big. to know and and is I everyone doubt it. kind of I doubt it. <laughs> it's special but you know it's thursday we're all confined um we're joining together and it's sociable so it's still indeed, special indeed so, so this is not the sort of wine that you you you, you open every evening but it's uh it's lovely it's, uh, hey we're not spending our money on anything else at the moment are we <laughs> mm. cheers so they've always farmed organically mm. but it's only in the recent years that they've actually got organic status mm. so on the labels of the older bottles it doesn't say organic but this wine is as clean as it comes really. They're really conscious that Urbina about their farming, how it affects the land, yeah. people, and any chemicals used, you know, bare min minimum, if any. Yeah. Um, What's interesting though, is that, so Fabio Urbina, he's a, he's a young guy. He's a really young guy and he's jolly good looking as well. Um, look him up. Uh, he, uh, he, th this family, it's, it's kind of unusual to find Riojas so old. And the fact is that these these old wines, so the, the 1999, it was only actually released onto the market about three or four years ago. Mm. And that, in, that includes the 1994 as well, which we were also listing. Only released a few years ago onto the market, which, which basically means that they, the family, have been sitting on their wines in their cellars for all this time. Basically waiting for the waiting for the right opportunity to say, yes, now they're ready. Mm -hmm. Now we want people to drink them. Because bear in mind, Rioja, um, uh, uh, Rioja's stall is that they, when they hit the market, they are ready to drink. And these mm. have been held back in the, in, the, in the cellars for so long, which arguably is, is, is well, it's unbelievable, to be honest. It costs an awful lot of money to just sit on stock for that length of time. But these guys have done it. Well, they've got a big seller and a big bank account. An awful account, lot of money. <laughs> a big bank account and they're not afraid to use them, which is great. Yeah. Um, so, John is drinking the wine. Uh, Bernard King, cheers, Dad. Well Good done. Good evening, you Bernard King. Facebook. Well done. Nice um, to meet you. Is, just, is drinking, regardless. Uh, <laughs> hi, Mel. We managed to get Mel's wines to her today so she could join us. So I hope you had time to hi, Mel. check out the canapes as well. Um, we have the Wahlbergs on. 
Samantha Jones, Sam, enjoying the Rioja. Glad to hear it. It is a stunner. Yeah. It's a wine that you can really enjoy. And actually, you know... It's a, it's a funny thing, Rioja. So Rioja is so popular and so successful for one reason. And the reason is it's oak content. And yet when you flip that into white wine, people go, oh no, I don't want don't oak like, in my like white wine. wine. Yeah, yeah. And yet in Rioja, that is its reason for its success. It's the oak, the sort of vanillary smoothness that actually makes those wines so sort of attractive and sort of Moorish. But this wine, it does need food. It does need food. Yeah. And well, I think with the lamy, with the lamy, the, the lamb and carrot lamb, and cumin puree should be a really good combo. Well, we've tried and tested it. It is a really good combo. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute sensation because of that deepness. The cucumber here might not work, but the chicken definitely will. Okay, well, let's give it a go. We're on the um, shredded chicken for, ne for next week, which okay. will go with the Pinot Noir. So. Okay, so here's your starter for 10. Great varieties, or the main great variety, produce, uh, used to produce Rioja. What is it? Mm. I'm wondering, am I, am I looking at this one? Am I looking at this mm -hmm. one? I'm looking at this one. Okay. You need to come into the screen a little bit mm. because you're out I'm of screen. I'm just eating my... Mm -hmm. mm. So I think... Mm. What's the great variety yeah. used in Rioja, Finn? What is it? Oh, I reckon, oh, Sam, no. it would work really well with the aubergine. Um, actually, the, we've got quite a lot of cumin in this uh, chicken kitchen <laughs> and kitchen, and um, it's that earthiness of the cumin mm. which really mm. kind of balances the kind of mm. grittiness, the, the mm. slight sort of grainy tannins of the yeah. wine. Anything cumin-y. Mm. Mm. Well, really good together. Probably mushrooms would do the same thing. Did you With... say aubergine? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, aubergine is the lamb replacement. Mm. Um, and Dad's got a good point there. Lamb does go well with any wine. So, um, however, that would, well... We can say any wine goes well with lamb. Maybe no! We'll have... No, maybe, maybe <laughs> we'll have a, um, a lamb, a Sunday session, which is just about lamb. Not with the rosés, though. <laughs> no, not with the rosés. So Sunday is our rosé day. Um... So we've got two rosés that we're going to be tasting. One is a, a German Pinot Noir rosé, which is stunning. And then our absolutely divine um, Olier Provence rosé. So John Boy got the answer. Well done, John Boy. Oh, hang on a minute. Oh, Ra is. No, no, Rachel was in there first, I think. Well done, Rachel True. Yeah, well done, Rachel. It's almost not just when you say it, but it's when we're looking. So it's a tricky one to win. <laughs> it is. It is Tempranillo. Mm. That, is, that is the main great variety in Rioja. Closely followed by um, uh, Graciano, which is lesser known. Yeah. And uh, Garnacha, or Grenache, is better known. Mm -hmm. um, and this wine's got a little bit of all three in it. Um, but mostly, mostly Tempranillo. But it doesn't really matter about the great varieties. I mean, no, we uh, we kind of it's dwell on great varieties. It's a no, place. It's well, a Rioja bit of a generic is, thing, Rioja isn't is it? a place. I've got, to, I've got to insist that, you know, you get good Rioja, you get amazing Rioja, and then you get some bloody awful Rioja. And it all still comes from the Tempranillo grape. Oh, I thought you were going to say the supermarkets. <laughs> oh! <laughs> but it is down to the individual producers, and that's key to everything that yeah. we do. We, so we, you know, at Hannibal Brown, we don't, we don't muck about. We just do the good stuff. The good producers, who we know year after year, produce really yeah. good, solid yeah. wines. Um, they don't compromise on quality, and, and nor do we. Um, Thank you very Here much. Here we are, let's Don't have a little top up. So, um, who yeah. likes white Rioja? Who's had white Rioja? Um, and another question which we might forget to answer, so we'll pick up again, is does anybody know the white grape variety? Oh in my goodness. White that's Rioja. Great. That's asking, that's asking. Well, you know. well, whilst, you, whilst, you, whilst you think about that question, just a little bit about this wine. So, as you know, as you can see, it's it's showing a huge amount of sort of like bronzy colour, which is which is the age thing. Um, we all change colour as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> Wine is no different. Um, it's been aged in oak for in oak barrels for fourteen months. So now you're thinking, well, what's it been doing since nineteen ninety nine? It's basically it's been sitting in its bottle in a cool cellar, just waiting until the opportune moment for it to. Um, to, to get onto the market. Released, so it's yeah. only had 14 months age in oak, but 
even that you can see, you know, the, the imprints mm. of, the, of the oak and the wine. So, so that's a creantham. Mm -hmm. um, and you think, often with the younger oh. oriolphus, creantham says to you, well, it's probably going to be a younger wine. Mm. Um, but obviously with these older ones, it's more about how it's produced. Yes. So with the younger creantham, you know, when it's just been released, it's going to be... It could be three years old. Yeah, and a lot more vibrant, mm -hmm. a lot more sort of fruit orientated. Um, we don't have another, we don't have a, a young Criantha, but we do have an amazing Reserva, mm -hmm. which is called Rioja Gavantha, Gavanza, um, from a fantastic bodega. Um, and that is 2015 vintage. Yeah, it's really good. Really now, because good. it's a Reserva, compared to this, this wine, it's had a little bit longer in the oak barrels um and a couple of years in bottle before it was released but it's been to, it's it has already been released and it's already available um yeah well worth a go fantastic yeah it is and it's you know for 14 quid it's an absolute snip yeah, it's great. a little bit more expensive as yeah. we know um, but, but you get what you pay for you step get what way. you pay for in this life um luke has come in with a straight on with the answer a slight spelling mistake but we'll let you off uh, so viura is the white real it's a welsh well spelling Viora. Viora. <laughs> You're right. From the valleys. Um, and Rachel is coming Rachel with Viora with the right spelling. Yeah, with absolutely. the right spelling. So. spelling. Well done, Rachel. Although it doesn't like uh, white Rioja, which is a bit of a shame, like actually. Rioja. So ah. we have two white Riochas, and they're very different to each other. And they both sort of, I think one, one or the other would please everybody. Yeah. So the lighter one, which is a fresher, more modern style, hasn't had any oak and is a really nice fruity, soft white wine. Yeah, it, dry it, it white is wine. true to say that the, the, the laws of Rioja uh, do say that uh, white Rioja should spend a minimum of, uh, an, an element of the wine should spend a minimum of six months in oak barrels, mm -hmm. just like its red counterparts. However, um, some of the supermarkets do, 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 do actually have uh, something they call, oh, I've forgotten what it's called at the top of my head. What's it called? Yoven. Yoven, Yoven, which means young. And these are, they're not really Riojas, or they're, they are wines from the Rioja region, but they haven't seen any oak. So they've been produced in massive, great stainless steel tanks. So they are clean as a whistle, very fresh, but they don't have an awful lot of ca character to them. Mm -hmm. So they're great for a year or so, but then after that, you know, you need to move on. Mm -hmm. um, and they are not really true Rioja. So, who was it? Sam Jones? I'd like to show you a little good white Rioja. She says she's a bit indifferent, so we'll show her something. Yeah, else. yeah. In fact, we'll at, introduce her something at better. the tasting, that tasting when we're all allowed back out, but only within two arms reach of each other. At that tasting, we'll have a little Rioja section. I there, there's a wine on our, on our website uh, called Akemi, A-K-E-M-I, which is a white Rioja, yeah. which has been barrel-aged. Have a look at it, read the tasting note, and, uh, well, we might do a deal and get a bottle over to you pronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John's, John's put a good point there, which is uh, Joven, or Joven, uh, it means young. And there you go, that's what it's all about. It well is, done, John. Young, it's a young red wine. Well done, John. Um, so I actually had a little question here, and I don't know if any of you have got any um, particular strong feelings about this, but mm. what do you reckon, screw... <laughs> or, cor or, or screw cap or cork oh yes what why who thumbs rather up, which thumbs up for screw cap thumbs down for cork or the other way around there's just gonna be a load of thumbs so we're not gonna know but um what why is our lovely non sancerre here under screw cap well it's a very good question actually why is it um crap I don't know we'd have to ask Henri Bourgeois um, <laughs> but generally I mean we, we, when producers put a screw cap on their bottle they're thinking Let's make, this is a wine that's going to be drunk young it's not going to be cellared for years and years and years correct um, yeah. so you know wine, you, you, you're unlikely to find a sort of entry level Chilean Sauvignon Blanc which is for drinking now with a cork in these days yeah because I mean at the end of the day it's, it's, it's pretty much 99% guaranteed that you're not going to have any problems with it, yeah. Which is which is ultimately, you know, where we came from. Yeah. And and I mean, there was one country that that championed the screw cap back in the early two thousands. Yes. I think it was two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. um, who really had were sick to death of having sort of duff cork um, being flown over mm -hmm. from Portugal 
um, and they were using it to sort of bottle up to 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 also also cork their wines. Yeah, close the wines. So you, you mm -hmm. use them as the closures, and um, they were really really struggling with with corked problems. And everybody knows what court wine tastes like. It's not very nice. Yeah. And uh, the, basically, the, the, the wine is, you know, buggered. Um, so there was a, 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 a country, and it was New Zealand. Oh, get up. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. What was the I'm second? Threatened. What was the second? <laughs> anyway, um, most people seem to be quite happy with the screw caps. And... Uh, quite like uh, the Wahlberg's comment, cork for old wine, screw the young, which is lovely. <laughs> That's a sign of someone who's enjoying. <laughs> I like that, yeah, screw cat, less catastrophes. It is true. However, you can get corked wine under screw cap. And the, um, the reason being is that it's, the wine has already been tainted mm. before it was bottled and therefore it should never have been bottled. Um, it has been near a kind of like a, a wood container of some sort uh -huh. and, and therefore the wine was already uh, um, compromised before it was bottled but it does happen um, my, 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 my best story in actual fact and it happened on more than one occasion was I had a corked gin and tonic and, oh, yes. and I yeah. couldn't believe it the first time I had a gin and tonic and I tasted it and went oh my god it's corked how on earth is that and the reason was it was the little cocktail stick in the wine in the in the gin and tonic mm. that was tainted with the taints that you get uh, the same taint that you get in wine which is a bacteria of some description yeah mm. and, it, and it happened more than more than once so beware of cocktail sticks in your gin and tonic yeah and i have a feeling i've had the same uh, in a coffee where you've got a wooden mm. stirrer yeah in recent years actually so it's pretty grim yeah so um, watch out for these stirrers yeah Speaking of stirrers, Sam Jones here, <laughs> no offence, Sam has commented and she said, isn't there a worldwide cork shortage? So shouldn't producers be mindful of sustainability and look for options and, uh, uh, and depends on the wine? And actually, I think um, the thing that the wonderful thing about cork, and I, actually, I don't know if there is a massively worldwide cork I, shortage. I, I, think, I think you're right, Sam, there was, but there was. actually okay. it's, 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 it's it's overcome well who knows in in current current situation that it had overcome those problems um although there does seem to be a really good ba balance in the world where you know screw cap technology has taken on a, a, a raison d'etre which is it's great for young wines mm -hmm. really great for wi young wines that are going to get turned over quickly so going back to your supermarket wines the screw cap wine if you had essentially if you had Two of these wines, so if you had an Henri Bourgeois Sauvignon Blanc under screw cap and another one, identical wine from Henri Bourgeois under a cork, the screw cap would always be the fresher. Mm. And that's yeah. important, that's important and that's why the supermarkets use it because it retains the freshness, more, more, it retains freshness and it just, it means the wines are more ready to drink mm -hmm. quicker. Um, another good point. I think there's the space sorry, of both. No, another good point that John just made was that I think I think it was regarding the uh, the corked the wine with the screw cap that can still be corked. Yeah, if it had a cork, it would have been corked. If it had a screw cap, it would have been corked. It was corked before the top came Correct. on, basically. Correct. Um, but it's kind of it's it's kind of an interesting one because it a cork corked. Um, Do you know what I think? I think we should have a conversation about corks. Okay. Not right now. Well, actually, there's a good question from the wall. Not right now, but corks. we'll have a 20 minute conversation about corks okay. in a few weeks' time. We'll do that. We'll do that. We've got lots of corks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> why do some wines that are old get corked? Is it just air getting in? And is it better for longevity to be plastic, apart from the, for the oceans? So, or as in screw cap. So, it's quite a good question, actually. And it's actually it wines is. that go downhill when they're too old, it's not that they're corked, is it? Okay, so the, the, the key to that question is that actually, if you, if you store your wine well, the cork should never be compromised. So, that mm. means that means keep it in a really good atmosphere. So, not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, not too, not too um, moist. So, you know, 10, 11 degrees cellar mm -hmm. with all the perfect sort of, you know, connotations. It's going to keep your cork nice and moist, which keeps it nice and uh, spongy, spongy yeah, which yeah. means it'll be a perfect closure in the glass. If that cork starts drying out, 
then it'll become brittle and then it is compromised and then air gets in mm -hmm. and you will end up with an oxidized wine which is essentially it starts turning to vinegar yeah so which is different to a corked wines the cork is actually bacteria that makes it taste like yeah. dirt yeah. and the oxidation is the salad yeah. dressing effect yeah. yeah so so key is if you're going to have old wines you've got to keep them in perfect nick like this 1999 which has been kept in perfect nick thanks to the fact that actually it was the spaniards that kept it in the by original the producer. cellar yeah, yeah. by the producer yeah so um guaranteed you're not going to be disappointed by that it wine. seems like the the rioja has generally been pretty popular and nice, i know it has gone lamb. nicely with the aubergine and the carrot cumin puree mm. and the lamb excellent um, so going back to the urbina so this is the 1999 we have also the 1994 Grand Reserva, which is a bit eye-wateringly expensive. However, 1994 is considered to be the best vintage ever in Spain. End it's of. It's a stunning wine and it's ready to go. If you like this, drink. the 1994 is even be more of a kind of like a, a put, your, put your woolly on. And yeah, yeah. Out. It's got, a really, it's got a, that extra time in oak. It's a bigger wine. It's yeah. a bolder, bolder fruit went into it at the start probably. That's right. And then we've also got the 2006, six, which we drank not that long ago. Mm. And it was, it was Lovely. delicious. Lovely. Yeah. A lot younger and a lot more fruit. Vibrance, I seem to remember. Yeah, yes, it because it's brighter. Um, when Pam says eye watering, just so you know, thanks Sam for, for the nudge. It's around thirty pounds a bottle. Yeah, nothing's it's eye watering, watering at Hannibal Brown. If you look at a if you look at a bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape, which is only just about ready and That's you know true. only just about drinkable, uh, it's going to be another ten pound on top of that. I know. And I know, this is I a know. stunning Grand Reserve offer, so it's well worth. And as I going. said, we're not spending our money on anything else at the moment. So buy your very fancy wines at handlebrown.com. <laughs> so just going to quickly move on to next week. Oh, actually Sunday. So Sunday, the sun's going to come out. We're all going to be in our gardens and it's rosé day. So yes. six o'clock uh, on both Facebook Live and uh, YouTube Live, we're going to be talking everything rosé from how it's made, where it comes from, why, where the really awful stuff is found and where you can find the good stuff and how you can kind of pick, maybe even how you can pick a good one in the supermarket. Um, not Blossom Hill, yeah. not Jacob's Creek, not Zim yeah. okay. <laughs> Um And then uh, next Thursday, we're having, we've got our David and Goliath. Oh! Uh, so the canapes are on the website already. We'll put a link to those, um, to that page. Uh, the David and Goliath tasting is a tasting of red wines. So David is, he's a little dancer on the sideline, and Goliath is, is a big monster, <laughs> uh, and they're both lovely. So we have a Pinot Noir at one end, a German Pinot Noir at one end. Oh, uh, sorry, hang on, I just remember no. on the real cut answer. Um, uh, German Pinot Noir at one end, and a big Chilean Grand Reserve Silla, Syrah, rather, Syrah, at the other end. Um, both with some really good canapes to pair with them, so that'll be a real good one to get the food ready for. Yeah. Um, okay. Tempranillo was the Red Rioja grape. I can't remember whether we actually said that, but Tempranillo it was. So whoever got that first, well I'm done. just going to answer a, a question coming in from Mr. Wahlberg, which is, uh, sorry to be a bore. <laughs> 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 uh, when wine tastes like vinegar, is it corked? And what is a wet versus a dry cellar? So when wine tastes like vinegar, it, no, it's not corked. Basically, the cork has been compromised and it's allowed air to get into the wine. So the, 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 the actual effect of air is oxidizing the wine and the wine then starts almost, it doesn't really ferment, mm. but it actually get, takes on sort of acetic, to, acetic bacteria and it, it, becomes, it becomes almost like vinegar. Mm. So it's not corked, it's oxidized. Um, corked wine is when there's, an actual, there's actually a flaw in the cork and the cork has actually been compromised by a, um, a bacteria forming of some sort, and it mm -hmm. actually it taints the taints the taste of the wine. Yeah. So you, the two different the two different um, uh, issues, two different problems. Yeah, faults, two faults. different faults. Um, yeah. So thanks everyone for joining us. I think it's probably time to sign out for everyone to eat a slightly larger mouthful than just a wee bite. Um, Sorry about the technical issues once again. That was yeah. a proper disaster. It won't happen again. Um, <laughs> hopefully you'll all join us on Sunday with Rosé. 
do pass it on, have a Zoom call and us on in the background, which we on about how rosé is made. Um, it was lovely that so many of you could come and view. And thank you very much for rejoining. Yeah. Finn says goodbye. Bye, Finn. Bye, Finn. Share, share, share. Uh, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Anything else? Anything else? Cheers, everybody. Okay, cheers. cheers. Nice to see you. Chin, chin. That's it. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>